Yesterday there was a total lunar eclipse, and in relation to this event, Rachi asked this question on Brandon's Discord. Do we know the maths, formulas, equations they used to predict this? I've never seen it, have you? And as you can see, this question wasn't addressed to me, it was addressed to Professor Phil, but I believe I can actually answer this question. So in this video I'm going to show how eclipses can be predicted. I'm going to show how it works on lunar eclipses, because they are much simpler than solar eclipses. With lunar eclipses we just have to check when the moon enters the Earth's shadow. With solar eclipses we have to check when where moon's shadow intersects the Earth's surface, and it's a bit more complex, so I prefer to stick to lunar eclipses for now. So the idea is pretty simple. We'll just take uh, initial positions and velocities of bodies in the solar system at some point in time, relative to some inertial reference frame, and we're going to use the solar system barycenter for, for, uh, for that purpose. So it's somewhere here, let's say, so we have Sun's position, we have, let's say it's Venus, Venus's position, we have the Earth's position, and we have the Moon's position, and they have some velocity, so let's say the Sun is going this way, Venus is going this way, Earth is going this way, and the Moon is going this way. Okay, and once we have these values, we're going to simulate the motion of all the bodies in the, in the solar system, and we, we're going to simulate their interactions via gravity. And whenever we detect that the moon entered the Earth's shadow, which is somewhere here, whenever it, we detect that it's inside the shadow, we're just going to say that there is an eclipse, and we are going to output the date and time of that event. So we start here at the Horizon system, which provides highly accurate ephemerides for solar system objects. Here is where we're, where we're going to get the positions and velocities of bodies in the solar system at some point in time. The Horizon system provides a web interface, which we can enter. And here we have some settings. So, as I've said, as observer location, we're going to choose the solar system barycenter. It's here. So we have to type at zero in this place. Okay, target body, let's start with the Earth, for example. So we are choosing Earth. And we can see we have two choices, the Earth-Moon barycenter and uh, the Earth itself. So we're interested in the Earth itself, we're selecting it. Now we're interested in a bit of a different ephemeris type. We're interested in the vector table, which will show the position and velocity in the, in, oh, it's even written here, a Cartesian state vector table. So that's what we're interested in. Uh, time span. Uh, we are going to choose a single moment in time. I chose uh, the 1st of January of the year 2000. Mostly because it's uh, commonly used as the starting epoch for many calculations but nobody says it has to be like that, I just, mm, I just chose it. And then we can just start from the 1st of January 2000 and simulate in the future, and we can even reach uh, the current year in, and we'll be able to see that we can calculate even the yesterday's uh, eclipse. But let's not get, get ahead of ourselves, let's just choose the date. So uh, we're starting at 1st of January 2000. And we have to end at a later date, so I'll enter the 2nd of January. But we'll only be interested in one of, uh, in one of the days. Now the table settings. Uh, there is a choice of units, among others, here. And we will be interested in metric units, not uh, astronomical units, but kilometers and kilometers per second. So let's just use that and we can generate. And we see a lot of useful data, so I'll point out, uh, point out a few. So first we see the radius of the planet, uh, equatorial radius, polar radius, and mean radius. We're going to use the mean radius to calculate the shadow size of the Earth, because we need to know how big the shadow is in order to calculate whether the Moon is inside of it. The next piece of data that we're going to use is the coefficient gm. It's the mass of the Earth multiplied by the gravitational constant g. We could use the mass itself and the, we could use the mass itself and the gravitational constant separately, 
the mass is given here, but the point is it's uh, it's possible to measure gm much more accurately than mass and g separately, because basically in order to get mass we have to measure g, and measurements of g are very hard uh, very hard to do really accurately, and it's very very easy to measure gm accurately, that's why we're going to use this value, and it's here. Um, and uh, the position and velocity, so it's here. It's a bit hard to read, but I'll tell you what this is. So this is the piece for uh, for January the 1st, 2000, uh, the time is 0000, so midnight the very beginning of the year 2000 and we have the coordinates x y and z in kilometers from solar system barycenter so those are the numbers we're going to use and we have the uh, components of the velocity x y and z component so those are also the numbers we're going to use in kilometers per second that's what we chose and that's it. Basically we have to do this for everybody in the solar system, so not just the Earth, but also the Sun, the Moon, and the other planets, because they also turn out to have significant influence on the motion of the Earth and the Moon. Uh, uh, during periods of tens of years it's, it piles up and becomes quite significant. So we have to enter all of the bodies. So the, basically we need to change this, we We'll look up, let's say, the sun and generate again. Uh, all the other settings are saved. And we have again the GM, we have the radius, we have the position, we have the velocity, we have everything that's needed. So we need to go through that, copy it and save it somewhere. And then we can go and do the calculations. Now, an important note. If you look at the ephemerides generated by the Horizon system, you see something that says TDB here next to the date and time. This TDB refers to something called the barycentric dynamical time, and it's a way of measuring time that's quite different from the universal time. So the difference is actually, uh, well, it, it's possible to find how to, how to calculate uh, the universal time based on this, and it's not straightforward. So first we need to uh, to switch to terrestrial time, but it turns terrestrial time turns out to be very similar to barycentric dynamical time. As we can see, overall will remain at less than two milliseconds for several milli millennia within the terrestrial time. So that's good if we just treat this uh, TDB as terrestrial time, we won't make too much of an error. Two milliseconds is insignificant for us. Now, terrestrial time uh, terrestrial time differs from uh, from UT and it differs by something that is called the delta T. Delta T is defined as the difference between terrestrial time and universal time. And to calculate delta T we need to refer to a source at NASA. It says exactly how delta T is calculated and we can see that between years 1986 and 2005 we can use this formula and between years 2005 and 2050 we can use this formula and as you can see delta t starts with value like 63.86 or 62.92 so it differs by over a minute uh, from the universal time so it's quite important to uh, to to add uh, this uh, delta t so that we don't end up with uh, with results that differ wildly from uh, from the real eclipse times, really. Now, how are we going to calculate the motion of all the objects? So, to simplify a bit, let's start with just two objects. Let's say that we have two bodies with mass m1 and m2, and we have their positions and velocities with respect to some reference frame. So let's say the origin is somewhere here, in our case it would be the solar system barycenter and we have the position of m1 it's let's call it r1 and we have the position of mass m2 let's call this r2 and we have the velocity of m1 let's call it v1 and velocity of m2 let's call it v2 let's say they are like that okay 
So this all is at some point in time, let's call it t0. So it's at, at time t0 and this is at t0. So now we have to calculate the positions and velocities at some time in the future, t1. So let's draw it in yellow. So where would that be? So let's remember that velocity is basically the change of position over time. So now if we want to calculate uh, okay, so this is R1 of T0, this is R2 of T0. So if you want to calculate the position in T0, in the first approximation, what we could do, uh, we could uh, take the position at T0 and add the velocity multiplied by the time difference. So let's say it would be here, and it would still have mass M1, and this, this would be R1 of t1 and this here this difference this would be v1 times t1 minus t0 multiplied so we could calculate this v1 times t1 minus t0 add it to the initial position and we get the final position and we could do the same here so here is m2 at the moment t1 and this is v2 times t1 minus t0 and this is r2 of t1 okay so we have the positions at t1 now what do we do with the velocities we also need to know how velocities change and the change of velocity in time is the acceleration so if we have gravity we need to calculate what the acceleration is here and what uh, what acceleration is here because the bodies attract themselves gravitationally so this will be a1 and this will be a2 so now from newton's equation we know that a1 or at least the magnitude of a1 times m1 is equal to g m1 m2 divided by the distance between the bodies and this distance is just r2 minus r1 or the magnitude of this vector and squared right distance squared so this is the magnitude of the force if we want to calculate the force itself we also need to multiply this by the vector pointing from m1 to m2 so we need to multiply this by r2 minus r1 but the magnitude of this vector is not 1 in order for this to be 1 to not well we want the magnitude of this whole vector to be this right and if we multiply this by a vector of magnitude different than 1 then the magnitude of the vector won't be this it will be multiplied by this so we have to divide by the magnitude of this vector so again by r2 minus r1 and now we can drop this, uh, these lines here because this will be a, a force as a vector. So we can just erase them and this is the correct equation. Now we can also divide by m1 because as we see m1 is here and m1 is here. So we can just drop it from both sides. And now we have an equation for a1 which only, and that's important, which only includes g times m2 that's why we don't have we don't need the mass itself it's enough for us to have the mass multiplied by the gravitational constant if we have g times m2 we already can calculate the acceleration of the mass m1 so again let's rewrite this uh, let's rewrite this properly i will erase it and write it again so that it looks a bit nicer so this is g m2 divided by r2 minus r1 to the third power because we have the square uh, square of the distance and another division from uh, from dividing the vector from getting the unit vector from m1 to m2 and this is uh, multiplied by r2 minus r1 okay and same for a2 we can calculate a2 the same way it will be gm1 this time 
divided by r1 minus r2 to the third power. The magnitude of this vector and the magnitude of this vector is the same, so it's no difference if we write r2 minus r1 or r1 minus r2 here, but it does make a difference what we write here, and here it has to be r1 times r2, because the force acting on uh, the second body needs to be directed in the direction of mass m1, so we have to we have to take r1 minus r2 here, and we have to take r2 minus r1 here for the first body. Okay, so now we have the acceleration, and we can do the same trick as with, uh, as with positions. So now we can say that this would be just v1, and this would be a1 times t1 minus t0, and the sum of that is v1 at time t1. And similar here, so this is v2, and this is a2 times t1 minus t0, and so this will be v2 at time t1. Voila! So we now have positions and velocities at the time t1, and now we can do the same trick again, and we can calculate the position at time t2, etc, etc, and we can just propagate this as, for as long as we want to. What I've just shown you is called numerical integration. Why is it called that? Well, we have some kind of a state. In our case, this state was r1, v1, r2, v2. So this is our whole state of the system, the positions and velocities of all the bodies. And from this, we calculate its derivative with respect to time. We calculate, uh, what we calculate is v1, a1, v2, a2, which is nothing else than time derivative of the state. r1, v1, r2, v2. And this we calculate based on the state. So what we have really is, let's call this whole thing the state vector, let's call it the capital S with this uh, vector uh, marking. And so what we really have is that the time derivative of the state vector is equal to some function of the state vector and possibly time, but in our case it doesn't depend on time, it just depends on the state vector. This is what is called an ordinary differential equation, and what you do to get, uh, what you do to solve such an equation, well, you do something that is opposite to, to a derivative, and that's an integral, so we integrate this. So that's why what we, what we did in the previous, uh, what, what we did in all those calculations, is integration, and it's called numerical integration because we basically take some concrete numbers and we calculate it in steps, and when we work on concrete numbers, well, it's called numerical. Now, the method I've shown you in, uh, the method I've shown you before, is a very naive one. If we actually did calculations this way, we wouldn't be able to calculate anything because this method is very, very imprecise. It's very naive, it has a large, uh, it, it causes uh, large errors to quickly pile up, and the results quickly become completely useless. There are a number of better methods of performing numerical integration, and the one I've used is called Runge Kuta uh, of the fourth order, or RK4 for short. And you can find this method on wiki, it's here. Basically, as, as you can see, this is exactly what I wrote uh, a moment ago. So we have some state y, and its derivative is a function of time and the state itself. And if we have that, we can perform the following steps. As you can see, they are quite a bit more complicated than what I've shown you. And if we do that, the result of the numerical integration is much, much more accurate than just this naive method that I've shown you a moment ago. So that's what I'm going to use, and let me just show you how it works. Performing all these numerical calculations by hand would be very tedious, 
That's why I wrote a program that will do it for me. And I wrote it in a language called Rust. I won't show you the whole code or discuss every line in it, but I will show you the parts of it that perform, uh, perform the steps that I've discussed before in the video. So, the first part is the, uh, the ephemerids, right? Our positions and velocities of, uh, of the bodies in the solar system. And I initialize it here. So we have the sun, we have the g times m, so the gravitational constant times mass for the sun. We have its initial position, we have its initial velocity, we have its radius. And we have that for every, every major body in the solar system. So the planets and the moon. So Mercury, Venus, Earth, Moon, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. By the way, if anyone's interested in the whole code, I will, uh, I will put a link in the description. This is the piece of code that takes the current state of the system and calculates the derivative of the state. So the derivative is basically the velocities and accelerations. The velocities we have directly from the state, so there is nothing to calculate there. And to calculate accelerations, we need to calculate the forces acting on everybody from every other body in the solar system. So that's what this part does. It iterates through all the bodies in the system and for every body it takes every other body, calculates the differences in the difference in positions, calculates the distance, calculates gm divided by distance squared and multiplies it by the vector from the other body, from the first body to the second body divided by the distance. And that's basically it. Then it adds it to the total acceleration. This whole part of the code is in a loop, so it will go through all the bodies in the system. It will sum up these accelerations, and once it's done, it will just uh, store it somewhere for further calculations. Now for the integration part, as you can see, I'm constructing something called the RK4 integrator here. It's actually defined in a different part of, of the code. It looks like this. And if you compare what is done here in this piece of code, you will actually see some similarities to the Wikipedia article, and that's because it's precisely the method described on Wikipedia. And once we have this integrator, we can just perform the steps and integrate step by step. I took the step length to be 10, 10 seconds, because the second is uh, the unit of time I'm using. So basically, I'm calculating the positions of velo and velocities of every body in the solar system every 10 seconds. This uh, I will talk about a bit later. And basically the simulation go goes for 23 years, as you can see, and it performs steps. And at every step, it just checks if there is an eclipse. If there is one, it will print it on the screen. Time to talk a bit about how the eclipse detection works. So basically how to check whether the moon is in the shadow of the earth, if we know the positions of the sun, the earth and the moon. So what we have to do is we need to know which part of the space is the earth's shadow. And I'm only, uh, I'm only interested in the full shadow here, the, called the umbra. There is also penumbra or half shadow, uh, which is also quite important and it's, uh, it's used to calculate penumbral eclipses, but I'm only I'm really only interested in partial and total eclipses here, and for that the umbra is enough. And the full shadow is basically where the whole of the sun is obscured by the Earth. And we can find where that is by drawing tangents to the sun and the Earth. Because if we are anywhere within this part of space, if we're looking from here, for example, then the Earth will take up this part of our field of view and as we can see the Sun will be totally obscured. There is no line from the observer here to the Sun that does not pass through the Earth, which means the Sun is completely obscured. Okay, but now how do we calculate whether the Moon is inside of him? So we need to know what shape is this shadow, it's basically a cone. 
and how big the cone is, with, you can take it from uh, from the radii of the sun and the earth. So if we have the radius of the sun here and the radius of the earth here, and here is the distance from the sun to the earth, this is the radius of the earth, let's call this part h the height of the cone of the uh, of the full shadow so fr so we can see from geometry that radius of the sun to d plus h the ratio of this is the same ratio as the radius of the earth to h itself and if we solve that for h we will get that this is the radius of the earth times distance divided by our radius of the sun minus radius of the earth. So we can calculate the height of the cone. Okay, now we have a vec we will have a vector from the earth to the moon r. It can be it can be calculated uh, by just subtracting the position of the Earth from the position of the Moon if we have it relative to the solar system barycenter. So it's not a problem, we have it. And now we need to calculate if this is within this cone. So to do that, the easiest, uh, well, maybe not the easiest, but what we can do is, okay, first we need to know how this cone is oriented in space. So for that, we need the vector along the uh, along the height of this cone. So this is parallel to the vector from the Sun to the Earth. So if we take the position of the Earth and subtract the position of the Sun, we will get this vector from here to here. And we can normalize it, which means divide by its length to get a unit vector. And let's say this will be this vector. So let's call it L for light because it's the direction of light from Sun to the Earth, right? Now we can split this vector to the moon into components, into component parallel to the height and perpendicular to the height. Let's call this, uh, this segment we will call H2, for example, because it's, uh, well, no, let's call it HM. Okay, this is the component parallel to the height, and this let's call rm small r m capital r m will be the radius of the moon okay now let's just draw this part of the image uh, a bit larger so now in order to check whether the moon is inside the shadow we can just see whether this distance from the axis of the shadow cone to the moon is larger or whether it is larger or smaller than the radius of the of the cone shadow at this point but actually it will be much easier to compare to to the segment that is perpendicular to the edge of the cone here so to actually to this to this thing if this is perpendicular here why because we will just compare the uh, the ratio of this distance to the distance to the top of the cone uh, th this ratio, we'll compare it with the ratio of uh, radius of the Earth to the whole height of the cone. Those, if, if this ratio is smaller, then we will know that it is inside the cone. If this ratio is larger, then we will know that it is outside the cone. So now we just have to calculate this, uh, the length of this segment. And it's quite easy, because we have the angle here. Uh, let's call it alpha, and it's the same angle as if we go to the top of the cone is the same angle as this one, as the half of the aperture of the cone, alpha. So we can calculate the aperture of the cone by saying that sine of alpha is equal re to the height of the cone, which we denoted h. Okay, now this, uh, this segment, let's call it r2, and Rm is this one actually. So now we have that Rm to R2 is cosine of alpha. Therefore, 
r2 is equal rm divided by cosine of alpha. So we had h, we can, uh, we can calculate alpha. If we have alpha and we have rm, we can calculate this r2. And now we need to take get the ratio of uh, r2 to this, which we will call h2. And h2 is equal to the whole height of the cone uh, decreased by the distance to this point, which is hm. But we also have to add this part, and this is this is r2 times sine of alpha. Okay, but now if we check if we check whether r2 to h2 is less than radius of the earth to h. So if we check this, we will only check whether the center of the moon is within the cone, the shadow cone or outside of it. We want to check whether the whole of the moon is inside or outside or whether any part of the moon is inside of, or outside. So what we need to do for the whole of the moon, we need to check whether r2 plus r plus the radius of the moon is smaller than uh, than the ratio of this to, to this. So then if this is smaller, then we know that this far farthest point of the moon is also inside the cone, and that means that it's a total eclipse. So for total eclipse, we have the condition that r2 plus the radius of the moon divided by h2 needs to be less than radius of the earth divided by h. And for partial eclipse, we need to know whether the closest part of the moon is inside the cone, and this is r2 minus the radius of the moon divided by h2 needs to be less than the radius of divided by h. And this is how we can find whether we have an eclipse. What I just described is exactly what the code does. If we take a look at it, we have the sun, the earth and the moon. We have uh, we have light direction, the vector l that I, uh, that I showed in in the drawings, we actually pass it from the outside, I will talk about it in a moment. And we have the shadow cone height, which is calculated exactly the way I've shown you. We have the vector to the moon, we calculate the h, uh, the h here is what I denoted hm in the drawings. We have the r, which I denoted uh, rm, and we calculate the h2. Uh, exactly the way I've shown, and here are the conditions for total eclipse and for partial eclipse, so nothing new there. But what's all this stuff about the light direction? The problem is the light speed isn't infinite. So when the Earth casts a shadow, the shadow isn't cast as we would expect along the line that connects the current position of the Sun with the position of the Earth. It's not right. Actually, the shadow is cast along a different line. Along which one? So if we look from the point of view of the Earth, it, from the point of view of the Earth, it's, it looks as if the Sun was moving. So if, uh, if the Earth is moving in this direction, from the Earth's point of view, it looks as if the Sun was going in this direction, right? So at the moment, uh, when we're looking where the shadow is being cast, we are receiving light that the Sun emitted eight minutes ago, give or take. Basically, the distance, uh, the sun Earth distance divided by the speed of light. So, at this moment, the light reaching Earth is the light that was emitted from the point of view of the Earth from the sun that was somewhere here eight minutes ago. So, the, the actual shadow will not be along this direction, but will be along this direction. And it actually changes the results, because initially I didn't include this in my calculations, and when I actually realized that I should take this into account, it changed the calculated eclipse times by about 40 seconds. So it's not such an insignificant effect. So how do we calculate this? Basically we need to keep track of the vector that connects the Sun to the Earth, and instead of taking the one from the current moment to calculate the shadow and the light direction, we need to take the one from eight minutes ago. And that's exactly what the code does. 
that's what this part that I skipped over before uh, is for. So this is the buffer of the light directions which keeps some, uh, some vectors from the sun to the earth from the past. Every time we calculate a new position of the earth and the sun, we save the vector from the earth to the sun. And then when we actually want to calculate the eclipse, we calculate the delay, we take the distance from the earth to the sun and divide it by the speed of light, and we take the light direction from that far in the past. And then we use it to detect the eclipse. So finally, now I will show you what happens if we run this code. And as we can see, it already starts to output an eclipse. The first one is on the 21st of January, and we have a second one in July of 2000. Remember that at every step it only advances the state of the solar system by 10 seconds, so it has to do literally millions of steps to, uh, to basically advance the time by a year. So it's really really fast actually and it only uh, outputs the eclipses so slowly because it has to do so many calculations. Okay, so it will be going into the future. It will take a while. I will show you something uh, I will show you something in the meantime. Please take a look at this first eclipse on 21st of January 2000. Please take a look at these times. It's 3.03 a.m. It's the first, uh, the beginning of the partial eclipse. Then we have the total phase at 4.06. Then we have back to partial on 5.20. And the end of the partial eclipse at 6.24. So we can check on the internet what the official times for, for this uh, eclipse were and I'm looking on the website timeanddate.com, it's a pretty good website for this stuff. And we can check the times, and we have, we have the penumbral eclipse, but this is what I'm not calculating. And we have the beginning of the partial eclipse at 3.01.50. And my program output 3.03 if I remember correctly, so it's a minute difference, not bad. Then full eclipse, so totality, it starts at 4.05, and if I remember correctly it was 4.06 in my calculations. Then we have end of the full eclipse, so back to partial at 5.21, well, closer to 5.22 actually, just a second away from 5.22. And the end of the partial eclipse at 6.25. So, as you can see, uh, my calculations work quite nicely. There are differences, but they are pretty small. They are on the order of a minute or two minutes. So quite nice, but that's only three weeks from the beginning of our simulation. We started at the 1st of January of 2000. Let's see what the program will output for yesterday's eclipse, 26th of May 2021. Okay, the calculation is finished, and here we have the prediction for the yesterday, uh, yesterday's eclipse. And as we can see, it also differs by a few minutes from the official values, but there is one more detail. But let's start with the times. We have partial eclipse starting at 9.52.48, according to my calculations. And here it's 9.44.58, so the difference is almost 8 minutes now. And for the end of the eclipse, here it's 12.57 and here it's 12.52, which means we have 5 minutes difference for the end. But this is actually to be expected because, well, this is 21 years of simulation of numerical integration. And numerical integration inherently has some errors. Well, basically, it's always, there is always some rounding going on and stuff, and these errors accumulate over time. So differ difference of just 8 minutes over 21 years, I would say it's still awesome, especially for such a naive approach. Astronomers use more accurate methods and they get more accurate results, but even such a naive method gave pretty nice results, so I'm actually quite, I'm quite happy about it. But one more thing, uh, if you take a look at it, you will note that it doesn't say total lunar at any point. It didn't detect a total eclipse here, and there was a total eclipse. The full e eclipse began at 13, uh, well, sorry, at 11.11 .11 and ended at 11.25. So there were 14 minutes of total eclipse, which this didn't detect. But again, it's actually to be expected because if we take a look at this eclipse, it was very, very close to the border of the, uh, of the umbra. So it was a total eclipse, but by a very, very small margin. 
So now if the errors if my in my calculations accumulated and uh, shifted the position of the moon just a tiny bit uh, away from the center of the umbra, we, will, we would not get a total eclipse because part of the moon would still be outside and that's probably what happened here. So basically I would have to make my calculations more precise in order to fix this, but uh, yeah, that, that might be complicated. In any case, I'm, as I said, I'm pretty happy with the result. The difference of only 8 minutes is something I'm, I'm actually quite proud of because it didn't take me that much work, it was just like two or three hours coding this stuff. And there, and I can now predict eclipses myself to within a few minutes. As you can see, we have a few of the future eclipses as well for the 19th of November this year, then for May next year and for November next year. And we have two total and one only partial. As we can, as, as we see, we can't really trust whether this is only, only a partial eclipse, but I think this one actually is only partial, so there was no total eclipse to be detected here. The times are probably off by a few minutes as well, but it, it would be close enough to know when the eclipse happens and to actually go, go outside and watch it and not miss it. So yeah, it's, it's basically as good as I could expect, even better than I expected because I thought that I would get maybe the same day, but I would probably be off by, I don't know, a few hours, maybe just a few minutes is really, really good. Okay, so that's it. I hope I've shown how, how one can calculate the, eclipse, the future eclipses and the past eclipses actually, because there is nothing preventing us from running the simulation backwards in time and calculating the eclipses in the past as well. And as I've said, I, I put the code in a public place and I'll post a link I'll post a link to it in the description, so if you're interested in uh, looking at the code in more detail, you can do so. If you have some questions, then ask in the comments, I will be happy to answer. You can also find me on Discord. This was basically all prompted by a message on Brandon's Discord, so I'm, I can be found there. And yeah, I think that's it. So thank you, and see you next time. Bye!